forget. Okay, now I'm recording. Okay, so good. So this hopefully this is a better system here. Um, so it came up, um, and again, I mean, if people if I um, if people can't see stuff, just please say something in the chat because I have I have things kind of set up much better now. Uh, so hopefully this will be uh, go a lot more smooth. I'm, I'm learning. So I basically have I've got essentially a document camera uh, rigged up here. All right. So today we're going to try to finish up a bunch of stuff, um, which is like SQL. And um, I said before that well, we're going to be transitioning away from the relational algebra type stuff. But then somebody brought this up that I probably should go through this uh, the division operator uh, just to kind of make sure that uh, there's at least some record um, of me going through this because I think you need this for recitation number two. All right, so this is the definition of, of division. So you have uh, R, you know, R, these are this X. Basically, you always have it so that like an X is a set of attributes, is a set of attributes that you can't read. X is a set of attributes. Okay, uh, that's just gonna be a convention. And then we're also gonna have, that's gonna work for Y and Z as well. So that's gonna typically be, and if, if we need to, we go out to W, okay? So generally speaking, these are kind of sets of attributes. And then arbitrary attributes are gonna be something like A, a and B. So A and B uh, are kind of arbitrary attributes. So anyways, let's look at this, this, um, this notion of division right here on this. This is a very simple case. And, and this, it, we'll be able to unwind this definition of what, what division is uh, up here. By looking at this case here. So we have R is um, these three tuples and then S, which is just the projection of B here. So the question is then, what are the A's for which they have every B, they have every B in the, in the uh, relation R. So it's pretty clear to see that what's gonna be the, the A's in which that happens are gonna be one, not zero because zero doesn't have a zero. It has a one for B, but it doesn't have a zero. Got it? Okay. so. When we basically, when we say that we're going to divide r divided r divided by s, now usually under division, there's kind of it doesn't the definition is general, but the assumption generally is that basically, um, you know, we have x which is a b here, and then we and then we have um, uh, y is a subset of x. Okay, so y is a subset of x, right? Um, so that's it. other. It's the definition still works, but it doesn't really make any sense if you don't have it. So this this works. So in this case here, is X a superset? Uh, a B? Yeah, that's a superset of just B. Good. All right. So let's just grind it out here and see how how this this works. So the way it works, let's start in here. And what we do is we basically we project. So you know this this uh, X minus Y is then going to be basically just the attribute A, right? So we're going to project it over R here. Uh, over R, we're going to project out. Uh, see this right here. We're going to just project out the um, uh, the, the A's. So basically, what that'll give us is that'll give us um, one zero for this piece right here. We're just looking at this one particular piece right here, and then we're going to cross that against um, the uh, S, which is zero one. Right. So this right here, we're talking about this, this, this part of it right here. This is that. All right. Good. Okay. So what is that going to wind up equaling? Okay, that's just going to wind up being the full Cartesian product. So what that's going to be is that's going to this is going to equal um, uh, one zero uh, one 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 zero one one zero 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 one. Right. It's the full Cartesian product. So this is the vet under these example relations here, this is what comes out of here. So this is all the possible combinations, right? Now, this is the kind of cool start part. What we do here is now we subtract off. So these are all the possible combinations, uh, just by definition, all the possible combinations that could come up. And then we're gonna actually uh, subtract away the, those combinations that actually are in R here. So the ones that actually exist. So that's gonna be minus one, 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 zero, uh, zero, one. And what that's going to leave over then is it's going to leave over it's what's going to leave leave as the result of that, uh, right? So this is this is the cross, and then now we're minusing off R. So now we're uh, this this right here now is becoming this whole thing right here, and what that's going to wind up giving us is just the single tuple zero zero, right? 
So this is the kind of the one that wasn't represented here. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to then uh, project out of that, we're going to project out just um, the, um, the A component. That's what this does right here. And so what that gives us, so this whole thing right here then winds up equaling um, just, um, so we're going to, it's going to make just equal zero. Okay. And so then this right here then equals, uh, that's going to wind up equaling um, one zero. And then we're going to minus those, and then we're going to wind up just with the correct answer, which is one, All right? So that's kind of like, uh, hopefully it made some sense. I mean, so, so, so the key part here is this right here, where you're basically doing all possible combinations, and then you're subtracting out those that actually exist in the relation. And then that gives you some kind of little inverse piece or something. And then what you do is you subtract that away from uh, projection to get those that for, for which there are all. All right, so I hope that that kind of gives you some um, sense of kind of what the, this division really is doing. So if you really understand all that, then I think you're in really good shape in terms of the relational algebra. Right. And also recitation number two. Okay, is it because the set semantics that we got only one in the first? Well, this is definitely going under set semantics here um, in the first projection. Um, so this projection here, yeah. So if we had, if we do it under, um, if let's see, what would happen if we did it under um, bag semantics? It probably might screw up, yeah, because it would give us back a bag. And then when we subtract out, no, I mean, it would work actually still. Um, but yeah, that's right. Uh, it's, it, this, is, this, this is all being interpreted under set semantics. Okay, uh, and then uh, let me just show a simple little example. Here's more of a practical example, uh, just to kind of, uh, so if I wanna say something like this, so now I have um, uh, the name of a person and then I have the, um, uh, so there's shirts and there's pants, there's black and there's blue. So there's types and there's colors. So if I want to say, give me the people, uh, so John has a black shirt and black pants, Susan has black pants. If I want to say, give me the people who have, um, who, um, uh, let's see here, uh, who, who have, um, let's keep it simple here, who, have, have, who basically have every type of garment. Um, I have to add this, let's, uh, let's, let's say Mike, um, uh, shirt, black, mic, pants, black. Okay, so now let's say what we're trying to get here is we're trying to get the people who have every type of garment. Okay, so there are, so the types of garments are going to wind up being just, um, let's just see here, do this way. The types of garments. Are just shirts and pants. So basically, what we say. So uh, shirts and pants are the the, the the types of garments. So um, and then they come in different color combinations here. Uh, so the question is this: Is that how would we do this? How how do we do the division operator? What if I say owns? Um, uh, uh, divided by um, project. So I want the people. So I'm going to get project. And then the type um, from uh, uh, ohms. All right. So what is this going to give us? Let's let's think about this uh, because this is a, this is um, gonna, this is a kind of a common error that would happen. So if I'm basically what I'm looking for is I'm looking for uh, people who own every type of garment every type. So who is that? Let's just look at back at this table here. Uh, that's going to be John because he has shirts and pants. There's only two types. There's shirts and pants. John owns shirts and pants and Mike owns shirts and pants. So the answer really should be what we're after here is we're after Mike and John, right? So what's wrong with this right here? If we say owns divided by just the projection on type here. Well, the problem is what is that owns is also over color, all right? So what this is really asking is give us all the name color combinations uh, for which which have um, which own every um, so if you push this thing through the actual definition of division you'll see that it actually messes up all right 
The way you really want to do this is you want to shave things down and get rid of color. So the way you really want to do this is, and you know, you go back to definitions to kind of uh, see why this is the case. What you want to do is you want to project out uh, the name uh, and the type from owns, and then you want to divide by the type of owns. Okay. If you don't do this, and then you have the three attribute relation here, then if you push that thing through, then basically what you're gonna find out is you're gonna find out that it's gonna say that, well, you're gonna to have to have John Black, and that matches with both um, shirts and pants. It doesn't, it actually winds up not working. This, it actually winds up, this, this winds up failing. It gives you nobody. Uh, okay, um, it would give you something if I also had it would give us John if I had a shirt blue and John pants black. Okay, because then every, then basically with John and black, you're gonna get both pants and shirt. Okay, so anyways, maybe this is confusing people, but it's gonna be helpful to, if, if you study this later, uh, you might get the aha moment. Okay, if you could only, want to project name, could you skip projecting type in the first projection? No, um, if you're talking about this right here, if you're talking about this, if you're talking about just basically getting rid of type here, this is gonna wind up, um, this, is, this is gonna, this, I mean, you can still run this through the definition, but really the only way that division makes sense is if this right here is a superset of that, okay? So once you take away this, then it, it's not gonna work anymore. All right, again, I mean, to really understand this, you wanna run things through the definition, uh, but, uh, but this will come up in recitation. So uh, yeah, so that's that. So are there any questions about division? Because now we will truly go on, move on be, beyond this, uh, beyond the, um, these kind of simple query languages. And now today it's gonna to be pretty simple stuff in a lot of ways, but it's kind of important just for us to kind of go through it. So we're just gonna kind of gun it through uh, the rest of this and then have our kind of, um, basically our initial SQL uh, coverage. Um, we'll come. We'll come to some more advanced features of SQL later in the course. But uh, this is what's going to give us the, uh, enough. This certainly should be enough for you guys to do the, the first lab, which maybe I'm sure many of you have already done. Okay. So null values. Uh, let's go back to null values here. So <clears throat> null values uh, are kind of an extension. It's 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 going beyond kind of your classic logic because it's basically a three value logic. But let's just see here. Um, the meaning depends on the context. So there's just this, this kind of general notion of nulls. And a lot of theoreticians have worked with nulls and it's kind of interesting, but basically it could be a missing value. So for instance, we know uh, Joe's bar has some address, but we don't know what it is. So she's simply missing. We know, okay, we know this person has a, a mobile number, but we don't know what the mobile number is. Uh, and then there's inapplicable. So if like, so if, if it was like, let's say, I mean, this is kind of a classic thing of spouse for an unmarried person, right? So. Um, the null means basically they don't have a spouse because they're unmarried. Uh, also, um, nulls are going to come in. I mean, you know, this is not really so much of the context, but just another way that nulls naturally are going to arise is through these outer joints. Okay, so you can kind of create nulls that way. All right. So if we just want to kind of get it, kind of nail this down, uh, no, basically nulls wind up being a three-value logic where we have true, false, and unknown. Um, and uh, so, so uh, there's the value null, which is a value. Uh, and then there's kind of what happens with null. So if I say something like this, if I say, if, I, if I'm gonna evaluate the condition, all right, does null, so we have this, let's say we have a value of um, spouse in the database or something, and it says null. And I say, does null equal, so this is a condition, does null equal uh, 366, um, uh, you know, some, not, some personal number here, uh, sorry. I don't want to use it because it might actually, might actually, might actually but it's be something with this personal number. Uh, so, but the value was null. So in the database, we came to like something where the spouse value was null, but we're looking for the people who have this particular spouse. So the thing is that we don't know, maybe they have that, that person as a spouse. I mean, of course, in this case, that, that wasn't maybe the best example. We say something like a phone number. We know they have a phone number, but we're going to basically say, is the phone number equal, this might be, is the phone number equal to that? Um, well, the, the true, the, the way, when you evaluate this thing, the actual value is, well, unknown. 
So it's not true and it's not false because we don't know. So it winds up becoming unknown. So what we wind up doing is we wind up building up a logic where we can basically say, what's, um, what's, what's um, uh, you know, so comparing any value, including null to itself, yields a null. So is null equal null? That's also unknown. Um, and basically what we do is we wind up having, we wind up combining these things. So if I say something like, I mean, just intuitively think of it this way, is true or unknown, uh, what's, what's the value of that? So maybe somebody can put it. So give me the truth value. The truth value is true, false, or unknown of this right here. Somebody, somebody in the chat, just, just type in what they think that the value of this thing is. Give me an evaluation, a semantic evaluation. What is What does this evaluate to? It can evaluate to true, false, or unknown. True or unknown, what does it evaluate to? It, yeah, so it evaluates to true because the, yeah, if it's true or unknown, well, then it's true. Uh, and then, but if I said this and, then what's gonna, what is gonna equal? Unknown, yeah. And then what if I put a not out here? So I say not. So yeah, this, this of course evaluates to unknown. And if you put a not over unknown, you also get unknown, okay? So it's well-defined. I mean, you can, you can basically define some kind of truth table here where if the arguments are, and then you go through all the possible combinations, you can figure out what the, what the, um, what the result is. So if I basically say that A, B, and then I'm gonna go through, um, uh, I mean, A, B, and then I basically say op. And then the op can be here, um, and, or, uh, well, I mean, I'm not really sure, but, you, but basically if it's, if A is true and B is unknown and we have, or that's just, that we, it's probably the better way to do it is, hey, or uh, not A. I mean, you, you know, it, not true is false, not false is true, not unknown is unknown. Um, you can come up, it's a finite truth table that determines uh, how, what, what the meaning of these things is. And you can also kind of do it as a um, maximum. So this gives you semantics. This gives you maybe a, a more of a direct semantics of what, uh, of how these things combine. All right, so when it check not true and evaluate to false without check. So um, is this right here? True and unknown, that's gonna equal unknown. And then not unknown, since we don't know what it is, it could either be, let's say that not unknown could mean that it's true or it's false, we don't know. Then when we nod it, we still don't know what, what the result's gonna be. So it's still unknown. So basically not unknown is unknown. Not unknown, that yields a value of unknown. Okay. Okay, um, well, I mean, maybe we can, I, I mean, I might've misspoke, but what, you know, the, there's a thing in the chat, but I hope that people kind of, maybe if, if, if people have a concrete example they wanna ask, like put, a, put an expression in there and then I'll, you know. Okay, yeah, so. Uh, and this explains, of course, why this whole business of why this, this um, with this null value kind of messes up a little bit, the semantics of this thing where we say select bar from cells where the price is less than two or the price is greater than, um, uh, than two. And the thing is, is that, well, we know, I mean, geez, I mean, the price has to be, it's null here. So let's say the null it doesn't mean inapplicable. It just means that, um, that, that we don't know what it is. So semantically, you would think, oh, this should involve right here. This should involve, this should be true. But in SQL, it will give you unknown because what we have price is, is price is, is null less than two. And that's unknown. Is unknown or unknown that equals unknown. So this will not get reported. So when you, when you try to get this bar here, this will not get reported. So that's, that, that, um... and then a lot, we lose a lot of things, kind of nice things from logic, uh, like the excluded middle. Uh, so, you know, there's a kind of an axiom that says, well, P or not P, when it's gotta be one or the other, is that, that equals true, but that's not true when we bring in unknown, right? And then going back to that, this kind of uh, max and min semantics uh, with uh, uh, one, zero and a half, half representing unknown, this shows you why that, that that yields that. So it, 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 it kind of ruins some of these basic set laws. And uh, people can wind up 
because of this, because of the strange with strange with un unknown, you can kind of concoct kind of weird examples in SQL. So the academics can concoct kind of weird examples. And then they basically say, well, we can't really trust. There's an old saying that says you can't trust any database that has a null value. Um, I mean, it's a bit exaggerated. I mean, but but once you start using, once you start negating things and you start doing, you can wind up in, in some kind of strange cases semantically. There are attempts actually to repair the semantics of SQL. I'm not really, I, I, it's hard to say whether they're gonna have much impact. Cause I mean, you can, there are a lot of, uh, Different. I mean, there's there are alternate ways of doing this, uh, but one thing that's nice about the SQL way is it's very efficient, at least. Okay. All right. So that kind of covers all the query. Uh, the, well, I'm sorry, we already covered the query thing, but that covers that covers a null value. So hmm. now we're going to kind of like get a little bit. We're going to kind of bring things up a little bit here. We're going to kind of start dealing with the um, putting a database into practice. So. Um, the, there's a, can you see what's called an IDM model? It's a little bit, you know, ID, you know, but they call it IDM. Um, insert, delete, and modify. And then you, I mean, this is an acronym you'll see sometimes. And then you'll see another one called CRUD, uh, which is create, update, and delete. All right, so this, this ability to actually make changes to the database, uh, that SQL kind of encompasses that as well. And the way it does that is with some, some um, uh, different things in the modification part of the language. Uh, the DML, the data uh, manipulation language, where you can insert, delete, and update. So those are the ones we're going to cover. All right, insert's pretty clear. You basically just insert into a relation, and then you give the values. So like inserts into likes, we have Sally, and then we have Bud. Uh, okay. Now, uh, if you base, if you had something where you had uh, a primary keys, so let's say we were inserting in like let's say that we were inserting into the person table. And there's a primary key with an ID of the person. Uh, if you put in, if you try to put in a new insert on top of somebody who's already there, you know, you, you want to insert a different name for the same ID, or even just re, you know the same tuple over again. Uh, it's going to complain. It's going to basically not allow you to do that. Okay, so it's enforcing these kind of constraints. Uh, but this, the idea that we can basically put stuff into the database via insert statement. And of course, these are a lot of times in practice, these are, are, are created by programs to populate the database, right? So it's, um, no one types, I mean, in large databases, you don't, know, you don't have somebody typing out all these things. It's a program that does it. All right, so um, it's good practice. Now, this, this works, but it's not good practice. Uh, what you want to do is you always want to put in the, uh, the names of the attributes. So there's a match up here. Um, so you can, so the beer is going to correspond to that, drink is going to correspond to that. Uh, this this um, becomes particularly important when I mean this is, it's necessary. In fact, once you start um, uh, inserting, st once you on the insert, you don't specify certain values, and then they become a lot of times they become null, uh, or they they adopt they take some default. Uh, but to keep everything lined up, you definitely want to have your attributes lining up with your value. You do never you don't want to have just ones that are bare that don't. You can do it in SQL, but it's really bad practice to have bare and non non um, non. Uh, specified attributes that are lining up with the values. Bad practice. All right, so then we have this idea of default values. So the default values, they get, um, they get brought in um, when you create the table. So the default values um, are gonna wind up being specified when you create the table. But if you don't have, if you insert that doesn't name an attribute, it, 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 it takes the, the default value. So, um, so this is kind of a silly example thing. You, you know, you, when you create the table here, you basically say the name of the person, which is a primary key, right? So if you try to insert two people with the same name, you're gonna, it's gonna reject that, the second one. The address, and then if you don't specify an address, it will default to Sesame Street, all right? And then there's a problem. So if you do this insert here, then this, this is the default value coming in. That, that will happen, okay? Now, this is very useful, very, very useful. And that is this idea that um, what you wind up doing is you wind up, uh, so you might have one table here. So I have a table, like, let's say, you know, I have a table that, um, uh, well, I could say something like um, uh, stock price, stock price. And then I have like a time symbol and oops, I can't see that very well, value. Time symbol 
and value, right? So one at, at 15 minutes after 12 on January 2nd, uh, some symbol and then the value. Um, if I basically say that I, I'm gonna create a new um, table, like that would be called something like closing prices. So let's say I have a table called closing prices and then I'll have a complicated query, right? So if I give you this right here and I say, I want you to give me the, the earliest and the latest um, uh, value for each symbol uh, for each day. Now that's a kind of a complicated grouping uh, attribute, uh, SQL statement, but uh, I think you'll be able to do it. I think that you know if you you know, kind of dig around, you can you can get that uh, answer. And then let's say we have another table called closing prices here. So closing prices. Okay, so that, that would be the closing. Well, yeah, let's take just take the closing prices. I say here we have the time, the symbol, and the value. I want you to give me by date, group by date. It might take some functions on it. I want you to group by date the value for symbols at the last moment of every day, at the closing, at the closing bell, basically, of the market. Um, so that would be kind of a complicated SQL, you know, group by uh, uh, SQL statement. But what you could do is you could have it, so that's your subquery here, and then that would actually just feed in. So that would project out symbol and date. So symbol and date would project out of that, and those would then get sucked into, uh, they would get inserted into this closing prices table. That's just a motivation. And it's, it's very common that you do that. So you're basically doing some kind of exchange, some calculation, and you're exchanging from one table and you're creating the, the tuples for the other table. All right. So, but in this case here, this is, this is uh, the example we go with that beer drinking example. So we have this notion of potential buddies for Sally and potential buddies are those drinkers who frequent at least one uh, bar that Sally also frequents. So basically here's the solution. So we have P buddies, so that's the, the potential buddies that's going to have, um, so, you know, kind of, basically we'll say something like drinker. Um, drinker. So now, you know, I, I put the, att the attribute in because you know, to make that match up here. Um, get, give me the drinkers where, you know, they're not Sally, but they are frequenting a, a beer. Uh, I'm sorry, they're, they are frequenting a bar that, that Sally also frequents. So that's a, that's that's what this kind of complicated you know query down here does, and then that basically anything that kind of anybody who qualifies in that then becomes an answer to this to this query, and then anybody who's answered this query gets inserted into drinker, uh, into potential buddies. I got a direct message here, but I the thing is that it's weird because I can't, for some reason I cannot. Whoever sent me a direct message right now, send me it as email because the, I, it doesn't come up in Zoom. I can't see uh, what the direct message was, which is weird. So uh, I'll just keep my have my email open here. So just send me a um, an email if you want this. I don't know why the direct message does that, but it does. All right, so we have inserts um, and now we're gonna have deletes as well. So to delete tuple satisfying condition. Uh, so deletes you gotta be a little careful with. Uh, you delete from a, a relation uh, where, um, yeah, so delete from drinker, um, you know, I could have something like uh, right here. I could basically, basically delete from drinker, delete uh, from drinker where, and then we have this right here. Well, actually it's not going to be such a great example. Let's see what we have here. So he, now we have this right here. <clears throat> delete from likes. Uh, so, okay, so we're, we, this is an easy one. We want to just delete the fact that um, Sally uh, likes Bud. Okay, so we delete from likes uh, where drinker equals Sally and then beer equals Bud. So that just goes in and gets a particular tuple and it deletes it. That shouldn't be any problem. What would be the problem with this? So let's say we have a big database with all everybody liking different beers and stuff like that. And then I just go and I say this, I say delete uh, from uh, beer. Okay, so delete from beer. Uh, there's no condition. Okay, so that, this is gonna, it's gonna try to delete all the beers. Uh, most of the time, so there are foreign keys that are coming in and they're pointing at beer. So that we, you know, we have, um, we have likes. We have the idea that, let's say that Sally likes Budweiser or something. So there's a tuple that, that basically is pointing to the Budweiser beer and now I'm trying to delete all of them. So if I deleted it, 
then that would ruin what's called referential integrity. So it would ruin the fact that there's a foreign key pointing to it. Foreign keys have to, you know, got to, they, there's, there's a condition on foreign keys that they have to, um, they have to, you know, they've got to point to something. Um, so, you know, so, I mean, I hope people see this, but if I have right here, if I have likes, and then I'll just say uh, Sally, and then I'll say um, Corona, that's the name of a beer, Corona. Um, and then I have a beer, uh, which is um, uh, Corona, with a lot of different attributes. Now, this right here is pointing to that. That's that right there is the primary key. This is a foreign key. So if I now want to, if I now try to delete from beer, what's going to happen to this Corona here? Right now, under under general circumstances, what will happen is it will block. It will basically uh, the database manager will say, "Whoa, easy. There's um." You can't delete this. You can't. It will reject this operation. All right. So a lot of times deleting uh, it can be a little bit of a sticky matter in that regard. And but we'll we'll show some ways in which you can deal with that. Um, but anyways, uh, so uh, yeah. So delete from likes. That that would be that would empty that relation. Uh, there's a little bit of a quirk here. Let's just kind of go through it. It's not so much of a quirk, but it just has to do with what is the semantics of deletion. Uh, so there's kind of a principle here that you don't want arbitrary decisions being made by the database engine. Uh, that's kind of bad practice. Uh, generally speaking, what, what people in databases like is they like the idea that you don't, that if you change the ordering, that, that arbitrary choices the database engine makes will never kind of make, the, make, a, um, make a difference. So let's look at this right here. So let's say that we're going to delete. Um, uh, we want to delete. We want to make it so that all uh, all beer that, that that manufacturers only can produce one and only one beer. All right. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to go through here. We're going to delete from beers where there exists. All right. So we we, we go. We're, we're walking down the beer table here. And beer. There's like the name of the beer. And then there's the manufacturer. All right, so we might have like Anheuser Busch, Anheuser Busch, Anheuser Busch, Bud, uh, Bud Light. Okay, so what we want is we want to say that. Um, all right, we want we if we go down, we're walking down beers, and if there exists another name beer from beers, which has the same manufacturer, AB here, but a different name, then we want to delete it, okay? So that's how, that's how we're doing. So we're gonna walk down this list here. So the idea is this, is that if we get to Bud here, now, it, now there is Bud, right? So we, we're pointing here at Bud, and now there does exist another beer, Bud Light. You guys can't see it, I'm sorry, uh, but you probably get the idea, Bud Light. Um, that has the same manufacturer, thus we should delete Bud. Okay, now then if we then move to the next one, now then, well, you would think that it would basically say, does there exist another beer that has the same manufacturer? Well, we deleted Bud so that it shouldn't exist. So, we, so there's a kind of a feeling that this should actually be, um, that, that, this, that this guy right here should not be deleted. Okay, because he's, he's now, after this guy got deleted, this guy right here is the only one that's by uh, Anheuser-Busch. All right, that's not, that's not how SQL works. Because notice that what that would mean then is it would mean that this deletion operation, based on the order in which it's going down the tuples, could, if Bud Light happened to be first, then Bud Light would be deleted and Bud would survive. But in this case here, Bud happened to be first and Bud didn't survive and Bud, Bud Light did survive. So that's weird. That's going to be a very odd um, uh, semantics. So the way it actually works in SQL is the following way. So that, that, that doesn't happen. So what we do in SQL actually is we go through like the table of, of um, we go through the table. So we, we keep it, we hold the table constant. This is the beer table. We hold it constant and we go down and we mark by evaluating with over, over the original beer. So we're not making any changes to beer. We go and we mark whichever beers must be deleted, right? So they get marked and then we delete them. So in this original example here, 
based on the semantics of SQL, they're both going to get deleted. Okay. So um, that that I don't know how often it comes up, but it does come up. So, um, uh, but it's important just to kind of be aware that that this general kind of idea in SQL is that you don't want to have arbitrary orderings on the tuples, changing the way that the semantics of delete works. All right, so we've got delete done. Now we talk about updates. Um, updates, what they do is they go in and they'll change like the attribute value um, of, a, of, a, of an existing tuple. So, um, so we might say something like this. We might want to go in and say that, well, let's change the phone number um, of Fred to this number here. So it used to be a different number. Now we're going to go in and we're going to change it. Okay, so that's an update. Um, and you can do, of course, make updates to several tuples at once. So this is kind of probably going to be a good one. Uh, that is that we're going to basically uniformly say that the maximum price for beers is going to be um, $4 or four, four crowns, $4. Uh, so when at any time a price is over four, um, then it's going to set the price to, um, to four. So it's going to collapse down the prices. That would be nice. Uh, they won't work for nulls though, if there's a null price. Is, uh, it wouldn't evaluate the true there. Okay, so this could affect all a lot of different beers, or a lot of different selling of beers, rather. Okay, so I hope that's that's clear. So this, so we've just kind of enriched um, SQL with inserts, updates, and deletes. Right. So now now we can actually change. So now we can actually in, we can have the we have the power to basically in, um, support CRUD. So creating stuff, uh, and then updating stuff and deleting stuff. Right. So we can do all that. Um, uh, I suppose that, that in SQL we can also do complex queries, but this just has to do with uh, uh, those kind of enabling those kind of operations. So allow it, it's all basically allowing for reading and writing of the database, not just reading of the database. If we just have selects, that's just read operations over the database. Now we can actually go in and change the database. Okay, so now let's hop into constraints here. So. Uh, constraints, what they do is they basically are going to uh, govern what are going to be legal states of the database. And they, these are very useful. Um, so I already talked about that referential integrity, this foreign key constraint, referential integrity. That is that if we have somebody liking a beer, then that beer had better exist. Um, yes, it is possible to change null values. So if we want to say, or price is null. Okay, so that, that will be, so if, if it winds up being great, if the number is greater than four, then yeah, that's fine, it'll change to four. And then if, or if the price is null, if price is null, then it's also gonna change it to four. And then there'll be no more nulls left, which is nice. Um, I think this will work, but I think it depends on the dialect. I mean, uh, the null, I mean, it's, yeah, this, this, I mean, I'm almost certain this will, this will work. It better. <laughs> um, but I'm just so used to basically typing it is null. So, yeah. Um, okay. Um, constraints. Uh, right. So constraints and triggers. So we'll start off with constraints. So this is kind of a nice thing I can do. Get all these all these things that we get in the physical world that are so easy to do. Um, so a constraint is a relation among data elements in the database that is the database is required to enforce, such as key constraints. So primary key, that's a constraint. Foreign keys are a constraint. Uh, now triggers um, are related to constraints. Triggers are more kind of generalized. Uh, triggers are a way to kind of enforce arbitrary arbitrarily complex constraints. So let's say we have a constraint, like I have a constraint, any arbitrary constraint I can come up with. Let's say, let's just take this, this course for instance. Let's say I come, came up with a constraint that says that if you're in one particular program and you don't get the um, labs done by a particular time, then I'm going to um, basically take away six points from your recitation number one. That's kind of a weird thing, right? But let's say I want to do that. I'm, I'm not going to do that, so don't worry. <laughs> but let's just say that, that I have these conditions set up that that I can that I'm going to make 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 an arbitrary action, 
So anything you can express in SQL can be kind of the, the, um, the condition. If that it winds up being true, then I'm going to take some kind of really weird action. That, that actually is a form of constraints. It's, it's talking about what the database can and cannot hold, but it's arbitrarily complex. And that becomes, and this is of course very, very powerful. You know, you could say something like, well, if the core temperature has risen a certain percentage in the last hour and the fuel rods have um, a particular um, usage date or something, then please sound the alarm or something, right? In a, in a power plant. Um, so, so triggers, they can be in very, you know, they, you can encode arbitrary kind of business rules or logic in these triggers. So they're very powerful and very, you know, it's interesting. But then there's also gonna be these constraints, these kind of the standard constraints, which you could do in triggers, but they're so normal, you, you, the database system implements them themselves. And also importantly, it implements them very efficiently. Okay, so say like, okay, some, what are some of these kind of uh, constraints? So we have keys, like uh, primary keys. And if you think about it, if you, let's just think about a primary key. How expensive is it to implement a primary key? It's pretty simple, right? I mean, you just have to make, you know, you have to, We'll, we'll, you know, later in, in the, especially in the database two course, we'll go into kind of exactly how these things get implemented and why they're so efficient. But, you know, then you have like things like foreign key or, or referential integrity constraints. Um, these are just, and then you have value-based constraints. So for instance, you might want to say something like the uh, degree level somebody can have is either a high school, college, postgraduate, you know, or high school, college, master's or PhD, right? Or docent and beyond that. Uh, then um, you would say that uh, you could put in those as kind of those are the only allowable values for the attribute degree. Okay, tuple based constraints would be something like well, um, you know, the debit always has to equal the credit, and that kind of, that's an accounting constraint. So the numbers have to equal on each entry into a, into a journal, into a accounting journal. Uh, yeah. The C, A, Adler, DC Adler. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a, that's the, for some people, does anybody know accounting? Accounting is actually kind of, uh, it's fascinating. <laughs> it's actually quite useful, so. Uh, all right, uh, it's, it's actually, it is kind of cool in a way, but I know that, I mean, getting all, you know, anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. All right, so there's tuple constraints and then assertions. These are, the assertions are kind of that general thing about what I was talking about triggers. These are arbitrary um, SQL Boolean expressions that, that basically are have to be maintained over the database. All right, so let's just get into these simple ones. A uh, primary key, yeah, 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 this is easy. All right, so we have, okay, so now there's just two types. There's primary key and there's unique. Um, uh, so primary key is, um, well, they're even, they're gonna, you know, you can do them over single attributes. So a lot of times you'll just do them over single attributes. Um, and when you do that, it's going to be, um, let's see here. So let me just kind of say this, but let, let's come back to unique because we have two different things that are kind of close to each other, primary key uh, or unique. So these are, these are very, I mean, no, it'll be kind of an issue of like trying to make distinction between the primary key and unique. They're almost the same thing, but they're not quite the same thing. Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, but basically the point is that if you want to put them over a single attribute, you could just glom them onto the create table command here. So you could have primary key here as well. So in fact, I think I would actually have primary key here. Okay, so that, I mean, this is kind of, you would never have this, you'd have primary key. Um, right. And then if you want to, but, but the, the truth is you can have these things unique and primary key, you can have them going over combinations. So in this case here, uh, the primary key winds up being two of the attributes. So a bar and a beer determine a price, right? Um, so then you you can't put primary key to the bar and then also primary key to the beer. You can't have them over two single attributes. That would be kind of silly. Uh, so instead you put it down here. In fact, there can only be one primary key per table, okay? Um, all right, so we're starting out with primary keys and then we're gonna go to foreign keys, but let's do that after the break. Um, yeah, so we're making pretty good time here. Um, we'll have all this done and we can be caught up by the end of uh, lecture today, it seems. So uh, again, if people have questions, put them into the chat. Um, and I'm going to pause the recording now and then resume at 11.15. Um, now. Okay. So now we're back. Uh, I'm assuming everybody can hear me. 
got it off. Can someone say a yes, please? Just so verify. Good. Thank you. Uh, all right. So, um, yeah. So this was this has to do with um, primary keys and unique. Um, and uh, in this case, you, you can make this unique um, as well. And we'll, we'll talk about the difference between, between those two momentarily. Um, actually, just in case, I want to maybe cover them now, what unique is. What's the difference between unique and primary key? All right. So one thing is that uniques can be null, right? Uh, and you can have multiple uniques. So the classic example is basically a table where you have basically, let's say, a person, and you have an ID. Um, an ID, um, we're going to, you know, let's just, let's just call it a um, char 20 primary key. All right. And then we're going to have then, let's say that we have name, char. 40, and then let's say we have um, phone number, char 10, say. Okay, oof, All right. so that we're gonna make unique. Okay, we're gonna make that unique. So what that means basically is that somebody can have a null, you can't have a null uh, ID. You have to specify the ID and there can only be one primary key. So that, that's gonna be ID here. But phone number, um, it's unique because no two people share the same phone number, unless they're crazy. Uh, no two people sh share the same phone number, but it could be null, okay? And then you could have like something like this. You could have something like an email. You know, people actually do share that, but let's say they don't, uh, char, uh, 50, and you could make that unique as well. All right, so you could make the, the, the e you could have both the phone number and the chars both being, the phone numbers and the emails both being unique uh, separately, All right? Um, but you can only have one primary key. Okay, so I hope that clears it up a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll probably come back, come to that later anyways. So that's, that, that um, that's a, uh, those are constraints though. So you, you can't, if you try to add, add somebody later on with a new ID um, and a new phone number, but they have the same email as somebody else who's, who's already been there, it will not let you uh, do the insert. All right, foreign keys. Now this, this is that whole issue of referential integrity. So we have bars and we have beers. They both, so for, for this to make sense, the bar has to point off to a bar table and the beer has to point off to a beer table. And these have to be the primary keys in those tables. So you can do it to two of different, you, you can, now you can have multiple value foreign keys. In general, when you have that, it's usually not good design, um, but it can be done. Um, and design is more, it's more of an art. So maybe there are some cases where people would say, no, no, we really do want to have a multi-attribute um, foreign keys. Um, but generally speaking, you, the way you don't, you don't let that happen to you. And, well, we'll come later on to in design. We'll talk about how you generally uh, uh, prevent that from happening. Um, anyways, uh, the, uh, maybe it's best to just start with some examples here. Um, so you have in the single attribute case, you do the references. Uh, so this is similar, similar to kind of like, so we have beers here with a primary key here. And then we have a reference um, references um, from the beer here in the in the in the um, cells table. It has to reference the beer uh, by name. So we then name the um, the primary key. Uh, actually, in SQL, this is good enough. You don't even need to have that. If you just have it this way, it should work. Um, what this basically means, though, just if we put it in, in kind of just just to kind of you know, reuse this stuff a little bit. This 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 the following constraint has to, to be observed. It's called an inclusion dependency, and it basically means this. Name, if you project name over beer, that has to be a superset of uh, projecting uh, beer uh, over cells. So this is, this is so that is a, is a subset of uh, 
this. So these are all the beers. So this is what's called an inclusion dependency. Inclusion dependency. And those will come up later in the course. So that's just so you, you can express it in the relational algebra. So that's what that, that's what a, a foreign key implies an in inclusion dependency. All right. Let's see that that. All right. So yeah, there's certain references there. But if you want to, you can also do it this way. Um, and you can you can have multiple attributes here as well. Uh, and then in that case, uh, you know, you have multiple attributes there as well. So this can be done um, as an alternative uh, syntax. All right, so what about the enforcement of these um, uh, foreign key constraints? There's a little bit of a trickiness to that, not trickiness, but there's a little bit of extra power that SQL is gonna give us to kind of specify policies about this. Um, so if there's a foreign key from one relation to another, uh, two violations are possible. And in this case, so this, so how can things get ruined? We insert, so we have um, from R, so we have R here, and it has an attribute A, B, C, D. And let's just say that then we have S over here, which has D, E, F. And there's a foreign key from this to that. Okay. Foreign key from R to S. So how can, prop, how can there be problems here? How, how can we, we basically have dangling pointers? Well, one way is an insert or update to R introduce a value that's not an S. So for instance, I'm gonna add, add, put something in here where there is no, you know, I'm gonna add something in here where there's gonna be a value. The value I'm trying to add for D does not have a value up here. That's an insert part. So the, the insert part, putting something in. And then if I take it away up here, I can also have problems. So if I, delete something that this that, that one of these tuples down here is pointing to. So this tuple here is pointing to that tuple and I delete this tuple, then what are we gonna do with the, this reference here, okay? And then likewise, if I, what if I change this right here, I change the value of this, how, what are we gonna do with this reference here, All right? So, cause we don't want, uh, uh, these, this tuple would be dangling if we just let it just kind of point, that point off uh, to something that we delete or change. Normally, under, under normal circumstances, what, what SQL will do if you try any of these, it will just block it and, and, and say there's a violation of a foreign key constraint. Okay, so um, this is just kind of an example of the De Beers example. All right, so the default, like I was saying before, is to reject it. Is to reject the, is, the default is to reject the modification. Um, but then there's another one and this this has to do with you know here's R and here's our I'm sorry here's R and here's S. It has to do with making changes here. So another way we can do this is that what we do is we cascade it. So if we have a likes of a particular beer and we're doing a cascade where we delete the beer, so on change we basically um, uh, uh, we delete it. Um, then what we do is then we delete the, the referencing uh, uh, tuple down here. And these can actually, the reason why it's cascades, because then this, if there's a foreign key pointing to this, that could then cascade. So one deletion up here, one deletion of a tape of a, of a tuple or of a, or, or a record or of a row, if you wish, up here can cascade through an arbitrary number of relations. All right. um, then, um, and then also the, the way the cascade works is also if there's an update. So if I change the name of the beer here, then it's going to change the name of the beer here, which might change the name of the beer here, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so in principle, you can have these things cascade all the way through. Another way of doing it is just simply to set null. So whatever this is pointing to, um, you uh, set, you basically turn that into a null because it's no longer uh, present in the database. Okay, um, so how do we um, how do we actually specify those? Um, so I think I've the way we do that is we can specify all of those inside the actual uh, declaration of the, um, uh, we, can, we can specify this inside the declaration of the, uh, um, of the uh, uh, cells relation here. So basically what we have here is we, we're, we're, we're saying that um, here's the table cells, um, and then what we say here is that, okay, well, 
there's a foreign key that's pointing to the beer's name and then on delete. So if there's a deletion of that beer, uh, then um, you know, up here in the relation, in the beer relation, if there's a delete, we're gonna set the, set, um, the, um, uh, uh, the beer value here to null, okay? If there's an update, however, so if they, if they, you know, if they, they change the, the name up here, we're gonna cascade that, right? So you can basically have it so that you, um, uh, uh, that you can have a mix basically on update or on delete, you can have a, a mixed set of different strategies uh, that you'll adopt. So it's very flexible in that sense to kind of to, to specify the governing policies here. All right, so I hope that's clear. Okay, so then we have some attribute-based attribute checks. Um, and the check condition, so this is, um, these are really pretty straightforward. Um, attribute-based checks is something like this. So we, we're gonna say that we want the price always be less than five, for instance. So um, basically you, you just put a check inside the declaration. So you basically you say that, well, the check price less than, uh, less than or equal to five. Um, uh, five uh, dollars here. So uh, what do we have then? Um, so uh, we have that. Then we have another one here where we're basically checking. This is kind of actually doing, this, this, this check right here is kind of doing a, um, uh, uh, this is kind of like a foreign key if you think about it. Because what it's doing is saying that basically when you insert a tuple into cells, then what it's gonna do is gonna do a check and then it's gonna do a, a, an actual SQL expression. It's gonna evaluate an SQL expression here. So it's gonna to check to see if the beer is in um, uh, the, the um, uh, names of the beer. Uh, so the thing about that though, uh, to keep in mind is that it, um, if you do it that way, then if later on there are changes to beer, so it deletes it, it will actually in fact be a dangling tuple, right? So you can actually, that, that's actually a way uh, in which you can actually get uh, dangling tuples, right? Um, I hope that makes sense to people. Uh, here, one sec, I gotta do this little thing over here. I wanna get ready here for this. Okay, so um, here, one sec, I just need to start this job here. Um, uh, sorry, I, I'm gonna be back in one second here. Just give me one second. Um, I just want to start a print job here because it looks like we're going to be able to get to this. Yeah, good. So that's right. Okay, sorry about that delay there. I just um, I needed to get some a print job going, which might actually cause a racket here. Uh, all right, so what we have here then is, I just want to repeat about this right here. So what is this doing, this check right here, is it's basically saying, is the beer, when you, when you insert a beer here, it's going to say, is that beer in, and it's going to select name from beers. So this is kind of like doing, at, just at insert time, this is kind of doing like a foreign key check. But then later on, you can change this thing or you can delete the beer that was, um, at one point when it, did the, when it first did the insert, the beer was there inside the beers relation. But then later on, we deleted it, but still it'll have this pointing to it. So this will allow for these kind of dangling uh, tuples, which is probably not good. But anyways, you can do that as a, as a check if you want. So yeah, so that's this is exactly this right here. So the timing of the checks are performed only when the tuple for that for when it's inserted or updated. So that's so updated though too as well. So if you update the tuple, then it's going to do a recheck um, uh, on the it'll it'll recheck all the, the um, check conditions. All right, uh, tuple based checks like this thing about um, um, here's a, here's an example of a tuple based check. So it's going over the whole um, the whole tuple here. Only Joe can sell a beer for more than five dollars. So, so basically, it's doing it's it's doing a condition that's over more than one attribute. Right? It's a check where you, you're doing the um, the condition over more than one attribute. Hmm. Doesn't seem to. All right. Finally, we have assertions, um, and no one's. I mean, I think Oracle maybe at one point did did support this. Uh, the assertion syntax, I'm not really quite sure, but nobody, none of the open source databases at least, support assertions. Uh, it's, um, I, mean, I, I mean, that's a good question that it Oracle does it, but um, the idea then behind an assertion, assertion, it's basically, assertion would be basically say something, 
it's kind of nice logically. It says create an assertion that says there's no rip off bars. So it will check that, some, that there doesn't exist. And then it has some arbitrary SQL statement here. So basically what it's doing here is it's saying um, it's, it's grouping by bars. So it's, it's, um, it's taking all the cells and it's grouping by bars and then it's taking the average price. And it's basically saying there's none of them that have an average price that's greater than five, okay? So um, uh, th this is again, what group I have in here, so if you want to so check on that. Um, so the idea then is that uh, you just, in, in principle, you would just create all these assertions saying, these are things that cannot happen uh, in the database. So that it, it's never, it never can happen in the database that such and such, that such, and such condition uh, uh, occurs. Um, it's, that's a little bit, it's a little difficult to, um, to kind of state, I mean, it, you don't really need to do this things in such a general way, but it's kind of nice in principle, logically, it's nice, it's, it's an interesting way to just kind of declare these things to be assertions uh, that are always gonna hold over the database. It's kind of clean logically, but implementation-wise, it's a bit, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of get a handle on it. So the way you actually do it, so exactly right here, so here's an example of one right here. So create an assertion that um, there cannot be more bars than drinkers. Okay, so that's, this is, so they can be arbitrary assertions here. So, you know, that means you're gonna have to check it when you add it. So think of it this way. Let's say that we actually put this thing into some kind of database engine. Um, well, what that means then is it means that, well, what, that, when can this assertion be violated? It can be violated when we, um, either we uh, add bars or we take away drinkers, right? So this assertion will be violated if I add a bar and that bar then, then may, make so the total number of bars is greater than the total number of drinkers, okay? And it also might happen if I take away a drinker because then that might bring it so that the bar, there are, you know, I don't, I'm taking away a drinker, but I'm not taking away a bar. So it's, it's kind of like, but what, hap what happens if I do something like I, um, so I have drinkers in our bars. What, what happens if I add a, um, a beer? Right? Let's say I add a beer some, you know, somewhere. Well, that's not going to impact any of this, right? So how is the, the, the system has to kind of go through and kind of do a deep semantic analysis of saying when or when, when is, is I mean, when does it, does it check? I mean, it could simply do the, it could do the following. They could have a list of these things. And after every operation I do on the database, it'll go down this list, executing queries and making sure that the assertions are being maintained. But that won't be very efficient, you know, as the database gets big, all right? And then and the number of assertions goes up. So it's kind of, it's a little difficult to kind of see how this could be implemented in an efficient way. So based on that, um, so yeah, so in principle, we have to check after every modification of the database. Um, clever systems, yeah. So anyways, this kind of motivates triggers and triggers are kind of the way in which this actually gets done. Um, so um, the way triggers work, triggers are, are part of what's called an ECA rule, event condition action rules. So the way triggers work is they, um, Uh, no, I'm kind of I'm not panicking really, but I'm kind of getting, I, I've got to figure out what I'm going to do here about the printer not, not printing out the slides. Um, uh, uh, I have a solution. We'll have to, we'll, we'll have to, um, uh, it'll, it'll be a little bit clunky here, but let's just, let's just do this here. All right. Um, so an event so basically, how are we going to do this? How, how are we actually going to implement assertions or something like assertions? Uh, the way we're going to do it is we're going to have, we're going to break them down in what are called ECA rules. So the event um, is some type of uh, uh, modification on a database. So events are going to have um, different types. And what are the different ways we can modify a database? Uh, there's insert, update, and delete. So what's gonna kick off a trigger or what's gonna trigger a trigger is some kind of event on a table. Now, if you look at PostgreSQL, there's also, um, they enrich this. I won't, I won't get into that, but, they, but in fact, you can also have to select, which is kind of interesting. You can have that as, a, as, as a, an event. I'm not gonna cover it right now, but I just wanna kind of put it out there. You can have select as an event, and that's usually, um, interesting to have when you want to audit the behavior of, of people who are querying stuff. So you want to see what are they looking at? So 
So just to be sneaky and kind of spyish, uh, you can have you can be, be triggering stuff on selects as well. But let's just stick with this here. So we're going to trigger stuff when we insert something, when we update something, or when we delete. So we're making changes to the database. To the database, a change to the database is uh, what the event is in this case. Now a condition is then something we're going to check, right? So in that whole thing about keeping the number of drinkers, you know, greater than or equal to the number of bars. Um, one thing is if I, I say something like this, I say, if you insert a bar, so the event would be inserting a bar, then the condition then would be something like, well, now we're going to go and we're going to check to see whether or not the number of bars exceeds the number of drinkers now. Okay, so that'll be a condition. That's the condition part of the trigger. Um, if that's not the case, then no action will be taken. It'll, it'll just be whatever. Okay. If it is the case, however, so if, in other words, if we have just inserted a bar and that in that particular insert just brought the number of bars over the number of drinkers, then we will execute an action. And in this case, what the action will be is to reject, is to reject the insert. Okay. So basically, it will just, it will not allow the insert to go through. So the trigger, uh, so you have a trigger waiting on the event for an insert. It passed the condition, and the action was reject. Right. And that way, you can maintain. Uh, the assertion that the number of bars has to be less than or equal to or whatever than the number of drinkers. Okay, so let's look at the syntax uh, of how this might happen. So this, I think this, this, uh, this example here is, um, well, yeah, I mean, this is not the best example. Um, so, um, Well, let's go back and do the, the example that we've been developing. One sec. Okay, so here's the assertion. We want to make sure that that never happens, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's do that. So we're going to basically say, create trigger. on, and then we're going to basically say bars. Okay. After, uh, create trigger, trigger, sorry, create trigger uh, bar tree. Uh, after insert on bars, so after the insert on bars, um, then, and this is kind of a, a little bit of a syntax about for each row, that these are happening on a row by row basis. So if this insert winds up being like an insert into, and there's a whole bunch of them, it's going to do it for each one of them. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically say for each row, when, okay. And then, uh, uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to basically say when. So this is this is the event. Here, this was the event part. Uh, insert on rows on bars. That's your event. An insert on on bars. So it's always going to be an event on a table on one particular table. Then, uh, for each row, uh, when, and then we're just going to paste in this guy right here. Okay, so there's the um, C part, but there's the condition. Now we're checking this. When the count of bars um, is less than or equal to the count of drinkers, then uh, uh, when that's the case, um, raise error. And then maybe give it an explanation. Um, Sorry, too many bars. Okay, so I mean, this is kind of just a—I mean, it wasn't the prettiest way of doing it, but uh, uh, but that's essentially what's that's essentially how you're going to maintain that one. So uh, the thing to keep in mind, though, of course, is that we we have to do this for drinkers as well. So what is—and I'll just ask in the um, in the chat here. Uh, 
if we just do it for, if we just have a trigger defined here on the bars, um, is that good enough uh, to maintain this uh, assertion here that the number of bars needs to be less than or equal to the number of drinkers? Is there another table we need to also have a trigger on? I mean, if we delete a bar, is it possible in, when we delete a bar that that will make the number of bars get greater than the number of drinkers? Uh, no, that won't, right? What if we delete a drinker? Is it possible if we delete a drinker that that will make the number of bars greater than the number of drinkers? People hear me? Yes, good. So the answer to that is a big yes. So what that means then is it means to get this assertion working, we need to also do a, um, create a, a, a similar trigger, actually almost the same thing. In fact, the exact same thing, but we need to actually have a trigger now where we say, uh, we'll call it a different name here, of course. Um, I'll call it the, the um, drinker drink. And it's gonna to have to be then delete on drinker. Okay, so it'll be that instead. And otherwise the same thing, uh, too few drinkers. or something like that. Okay, so we attacked it in both directions. So we, we've got it going in, in, um, in, both, uh, in both directions. Um, that's how you actually, so, and then notice here that there's no trigger to, to maintain this guy here. There's no trigger on something like uh, beers because it's irrelevant. Um, okay, good. All right, so that, um, that concludes that. I, Unfortunately, what I think I was trying to do is I was trying to print out these, these next slides here. So I'm going to have to do it a little different way. I think what I'm going to have to do is um, uh, I need to share the screen. There's a different screen. And to do that, I need to do this. Um, OK, one second. Just hang with me, people. And okay, okay. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of this. Exit. And then let's do the following. Down to downloads. And then we are. And then this. Again, apologies. And then present. Good. All right, so uh, share the screen. And then we go to this guy. All right, so I, I imagine people can see this now. All right, so now, um, what we're going to do now, so you've, you've been given um, the basic uh, query languages and you've been given uh, a, some notion of constraints that you can define over, you know, when you, so you can create these tables, you can have these constraints. But now what we're going to do in the course is we're going to be moving now toward something that's much more, I guess, real world. And this is actually really, really critical stuff um, to get this right. So the issue is mostly this, is that you... Um, when we talk about entity relationship modeling, so now what we're gonna, we're gonna really kind of switch gears here. And we're gonna start thinking about, somebody comes to us with an actual, um, uh, they wanna represent something. They wanna, you know, they, they have a business problem or they have some, you know, they, they, um, they have kind of a, a core problem that they wanna get a database to help them with. So let's, let's just kind of like brainstorm here and think about what that might be. So let's say somebody comes to you and they say that what we want is we want to have like a big recipe database, you know, foods. We want to have a food database. And what we want to have is we want to have a bunch of recipes and those, each of those recipes has a set of foods in a certain number of, me in, in a certain measure that are going to be ingredients in that, in that recipe, okay? 
And then they say, and also what we want is we want to record what is in the person's kitchen or, you know, or, or in their pantry or whatever. So what foods does the person actually have at home? Right. So the kind of inventory, we want to represent the inventory of the foods that the person has at home. And then based on that, we want to say, which recipes can they cook? Right. So does, does everybody follow that? I mean, does everybody follow what, 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 but you know, somebody comes to you and they say, they say, hey, you know, you, you know databases now, you've taken the database one course and, and, and um, could you help me do a data, design a database that will do that? So people understand? I mean, you wanna have, again, so, so what we want is we want, uh, all right. So now the, the issue is this, is that, okay, you, you've heard that, you've understood that. Um, and then, uh, do you, I mean, maybe what people should do right now, kind of as a little bit of an exercise is that just, I mean, maybe you don't even need this entity relationship stuff. Maybe you don't need any kind of design stuff. How many people feel like they can, they can solve that database right now? I mean, how many people feel like they can just define the tables? Maybe, All right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, it's, I mean, it's not that complicated, right? I mean, if you think about it, that, that, that example is not particularly complicated. I mean, what, let's just think of it, you know, intuitively, well, we're gonna probably have a table for foods and we're probably gonna have a table for recipes. And then we're probably gonna have a table for what foods are in a, in a given recipe. Right, so that be we'll be up to three, three tables then, and then we might have a table that just has like just um, a, you know, we might have a table that represents. Um, I mean, if there's only if we're only doing this for ourselves, then we only have one kitchen to consider, right? But let's say that we want to do this for like more than 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 one party, so we basically want to have a table that represents kitchens, right? And then we want to have a table that represents um, uh, inventory. So what food is in that kitchen and in what amount? So it looks as if what we're going to have here then is we're going to have basically, well, food, um, recipe, uh, food in recipe, um, uh, kit, uh, well, let's call it a house, house, and then we're going to have food in house. So that would be one, two, three, four, five tables, right? That'll be five tables. Uh, and then there might be foreign keys among those tables, right? So we might kind of think, but so. I think the thing is that what would be kind of interesting here now is just for people just to say, well, um, I mean, one way of just doing this is saying we don't need any anything else. We already have the we already have the the, the tools ready. We already have the capability to rep represent that um, that scenario. Now the queries themselves are going to be maybe like a little bit complicated. It's going to actually be a for all query, by the way, uh, to kind of pluck out what foods can be made, uh, what recipes can be made at what house. That's going to it's a little bit of a you know. You know, you wind up having a double not exists. I mean, so, you know, you could probably, you know, the, the query is a different thing, but just represent the basic data. Probably most of you can do it if you think about it. And it might be worth it to try, uh, to try to do it. Just to, I mean, you know, do, I mean, it's interesting to, to do it before you see any of the, of the conceptual modeling stuff, just to do it right off the bat, right? Because actually that's the way things get, usually get done in the world, that people don't, you know, they just kind of do it, you know, they just rush in and do it because they think, well, yeah, I can think this, I can think this through. I know how to define tables and they just kind of do it kind of willy nilly and just come up with a definition of the, of the schema. Um, now let's scale that up though. Uh, and I don't, we won't go into all the details, but if we scale it up and now we say, we're not talking about refrigerators. We're not talking about um, uh, recipes. We're not talking about food and stuff like that and inventories and whatever. We're talking about running a full hospital all right, where you got patients, you have doctors, you have uh, different levels of staff, you have, you know, physicians, you might, I mean, you have physicians, you have nurses, you have uh, uh, different categories, different, you know, different classes of the nurses, you have the time at which they're going to be on a certain, scheduled to be on a certain ward, 
you have the patients, you have the diseases they have, you have the, I mean, now it's getting pretty complicated, isn't it? I mean, and it's also fairly diffuse. I mean, just imagine you have this kind of general feeling of like what the hospital has to do, but it becomes this giant complex uh, system uh, that has to be, that has to be dealt with and modeled, right? And 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 you don't really want to do it willy nilly. I mean, you can sit there and you can start defining tables, and then it's not going to be long until you have thirty or forty tables running around, right? I mean, it's going to get complicated, isn't it? I mean, you look at the, let's say that I mean, you look at the hospital system that kind of governs Umeo Hospital. I mean, it's not it's that's, it, I mean, I told you this little recipe thing. Where we said five tables, but I mean, how many tables are running this? this BMS cross system that they're, that, that's over at the hospital. I mean, it's a lot. I mean, it's a giant complicated system to kind of, you know, and then they even have it integrated in with to have like, um, you know, uh, images and, you know, it's like, can you see how it might be a little bit, how you might want to have a more principled way to do design than just kind of start kind of knocking out table definitions willy nilly? People see, maybe? It might be, it might make sense to, to, to actually have some principles. Yeah. Okay. Good. I mean, I'm glad everybody agrees with that because, I mean, I don't know. You could be a contrarian and say, "Nah, you got to just knock it out table by table and just keep on hacking at the thing until you kind of have it working." And uh, that actually might be the way ultimately you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get it done. But we want to kind of come to this kind of little more high level, and we want to say, "Can can we at least?" I mean, you know, we're all, like there's a whole kind of notion of being a hacker snob. So what a hacker snob says, they say, no, 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 it's all about the tables and all that. And all these people kind of running around, you know, they're, they're just mostly confused and we just need to kind of knock out the right, you know, the, the right table with the right definition. And hey, look, I'm kind of a hacker snob myself because I think ultimately it comes down to how, what, what the tables look like. I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down to. But you got to bring these people in and you kind of, kind of, you have to kind of interrogate from them, well, what do you really want to represent? So there's this really kind of... Um, long process that you have to go through. Let's say, let's say that you were going to go and, you were, and there was a hospital or there was some new, uh, you know, like, like, I mean, they're, they're building some new factory that's going to make batteries or something up in, you know, up, up, up here in Norland or something. And they, they haven't decided on how they're going to design the database that records all the factory operations, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, you, you got to sit down with the people who are going to be doing it and you got to talk to them and you got to kind of have to understand what are the, re what are the requirements, what's going on in this thing. And it's going to be this very, very, uh, painful pro it's not painful I mean it's very it's kind of interesting but the thing is they're not really completely certain what they're what they're doing I mean you know no one is right I mean everybody's kind of a little bit incompetent everybody's kind of just doing things kind of like by the seat of their pants ultimately um, but you're gonna have to sit down let's say you have like 20 people in a room and you're gonna have to sit there and you're gonna have to kind of extract from them what they want out of the database what what do they want the database to represent um, if you start flashing up, ta you know, tables and stuff like that, they're all going to boggle and say, well, what, I mean, they don't understand this stuff and it's going to be really confusing. So one way to do it is to go through these interviews and to try to keep on talking to them and then to kind of basically build out uh, what's called an ER diagram or entity relationship model. And that's what we're going to cover now um, is this kind of graphical language that helps us kind of represent things. And then later on, we're going to turn that into table definitions. Okay. So it gives some people kind of a more of a pictorial way uh, to represent and to kind of um, talk about what the model is. Um, and it's not just pictorial in the sense that it's just a bunch of like um, slideware. I mean, this is one of the big problems, of course, is that once you start getting a bunch of pe 20 people in a room and everything comes, becomes pictorial, then people just wind up wasting a lot of time and things drift. And you always have that one person who's like going off on a, you know, you have people going off on these weird tangents and it's just kind of like nothing gets done. But what's nice about ER diagrams, and you know, ER diagrams is also one of those results that, that won the Turing Award. So this is this is this stuff is pretty good. In fact, it won the Turing Award. Chen won the, the Turing Award based on ER diagrams uh, because this really is a good result. I mean, this is the way to do it because when you work with ER diagrams, you're not just uh, it's not just diagrams that are just kind of you know slideware, which are just kind of fluffy stuff. There actually is a way to translate these to table definitions. So you can work with these diagrams, you can talk to people, you can kind of argue with them and get the model right. But what you've been arguing and getting the model right over is this diagram language, which has a, has a semantics, which then can translate into actual table definitions. You do that though, and then you still work with the tables. Uh, ultimately, you're gonna be working with the tables. But we wanna start out when, as we talk to people and, and get them kind of to talk about this diagram language 
so that we have a chance uh, to at least kind of get, it, it, we have a chance to have a productive discussion around what the model is before we actually start talking about tables. So that's kind of the introduction to what this stuff is. All right, so it allows you to sketch the database schema designs and include some constraints, but not operations. Okay, yeah, it's, um, it's pictures and it's called entity di relationship diagrams. Uh, and then you, what's important, of course, is you can convert these into specific um, table definitions. Uh, right, yeah, design is a serious business. The boss knows what they want in, the in a database, but they don't know, um, they know they want a database, but they don't know what they want in it. All right. Um, so this, um, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, actually one of the, th not doing this right, not getting the design right has been, has, has led to, to countless billions, if not trillions of dollars wasted and probably a lot of lives lost in, in, in society. So, I mean, when you have these kind of fabulous um, crashes of, of big projects, a lot of times it's because they don't take this so seriously or because the, the boss at time T has a certain idea of what should be in the database and then something happens and at time T plus something, they have a completely different idea of what they want in the database. But the ship has already sailed and there's kind of a mismatch between what's really needed and what the design was for. So that, that's kind of a common common uh, uh, road to disaster. All right, so that's just in, I guess we have like four minutes here. Let's just kind of at least just kind of very, very quickly kind of uh, break out kind of what these things actually look like. So what we have is we have what are called entities. And I think actually at this point, I'm gonna switch over here and just kind of do this kind of, on, um, cause we only have like four or five minutes. So I think I'm gonna do this as a um, uh, uh, stop share. And I'm gonna do it, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do it over here as all right so a lot of times what we have is it, it, let's just let's just look, go back to that recipe example and i'll just do the er diagram for that recipe so you have the entities which are usually the nouns the, 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 the nouns n-o-u-n uh, you know the substantive uh, of the domain so we have something like food right and then we have recipe and then we have we have food we have recipe and we have house These get, these are entity sets now. So there's a, there's a set of foods, but they're nouns. And there's a set of recipes uh, and there's a set of houses, okay? Now, um, what we have here then is we have foods and then we have a relationship. Note, this is a relationship, not a relation. Okay, so we have foods that are um, in recipe. Right, so you know, chicken cacciatore, chicken is in the recipe. Chicken cacciatore. All right. Well, let's get this thing. Okay, let's give every food. Let's give it an ID. Right. We want to have. Now we're talking about the attributes. Let's give it an ID, like food number seventy-seven forty-four. Right. And then let's give every recipe an ID as well, uh, like seventy-nine eighty-four, twenty-one. All right. Um, and they have a name, like chicken. And they have a name here as well, like chicken cacciatore. Right. So we have a notion of a food and we have a notion of a recipe and we have a notion of something being in that. So um, notice here, the underlines basically make it so that these are identifying. These are gonna be ultimately be primary key type things. Okay, so that's easy enough. And then we have a house which has, we'll just call this has. So a house has a food. And then a house, of course, has an ID and an address. Okay, so what we have here, these are the basic, the, the, and I, what are the, this is the, these are kind of what the diagrams are gonna wind up looking like. And what we have here is we have rectangles, and those are entities. We have diamonds. Notice I'm not saying diamond hands. <laughs> Uh, which are relationships. These are like the verbs. So these are like the nouns and these are like the verbs. And then we have uh, these circles, which are, are attributes. Okay. Now what we'll see later is we'll see that there's ways that these, these are, this is a many to many. So chicken can be the part of many different recipes and a recipe can have many different foods. A house can have many different um, foods um, and a food can be in many different houses, right? 
Now the house might have a favorite recipe. So there's only, and there can only be one favorite. Right? House can have a favorite recipe. And that will then give us this. So it means that if you have a house, it will point, because that's what the pointer does, it will point to a single recipe. So what we're showing here is we're showing that we're getting these, these this is many to many, this is many to many, and this right here is uh, basically uh, many to one. Right? So many different houses have a favorite recipe, but for any particular house, it's only going to be a single recipe. Right, so that's um, this is I mean, so this this right here is the ingredient. So right now, if you want to start trying to do the hospital example, you 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 know you can start with this, right? So then you can kind of now, as it turns out, this right here has a direct translation to a set of tables, right? And there's an algorithm we can run over this thing to obtain our tables, right? But this is an easier way to talk about things because you can sit there and, and and keep on revising this diagram here as you're discussing a larger and larger domain. So you know it. it this, is a, this has been proven uh, to be a more productive way to go about doing design than just kind of doing the raw table definition, okay? I hope that makes sense to people. Um, and it looks like we've gone over one minute, but that's okay. There, if there's any questions, uh, how do we know which way the lines go? Um, well, th this is, I mean, it's just, um, let's see. I guess when you say that's a line, Lines are connecting all these things together. And lines are gonna basically, you're gonna have lines that are gonna, you're gonna have a line that's gonna look like this, it's gonna look like that, or it's gonna look like that. Or or it's gonna be one of these little dinky ones here which don't have arrows. If, if it's just an attribute, it doesn't have arrows. I, I was just uh, wondering about the, because uh, food is in recipe, but recipe is not in food. Yeah, so what you, that's, that's, that's a good point. Okay, so I see what you're, I see what you're saying. Now, so what, what you're asking is linguistically, how do the lines go? So what you, sometimes you'll see, and this is what I do as practice, is I'll say food in recipe and food has um, as ingredient. <laughs> okay, whatever, you, you can name these arbitrarily. So, a lot of times what you'll do is you basically say in one direction, it reads that way. In the other direction, you can give it an alternate name and it reads that, that direction. Okay. So, yes. that, so but th that's, it's really, that's a really good point. Um, uh, Cause, and I don't know how many people actually do this. They should do this more. This is actually my, one of my big complaints actually is that people don't, they're not, they're not doing this in kind of a um, really nice way. Um, there's a tool called Irwin which was popular. I'm not sure what the status of Irwin is. Irwin does it pretty well, but the really, the, the, um, the great sin, I mean, I'll, I'll be opinionated and I'll just say it. The great sin of modern design is UML and UML sucks, <laughs> sorry. Because what UML, I mean, I can talk a little bit more about this, but when people do their designs in UML, it's not, okay, they have a lot of little syntax on it. But the thing is that what's important about, what's good about ER is it stays conceptual. We don't want to get too technical. We want to keep things at a conceptual level. I think putting the forward and backward names on the, rela on the relationships is a pretty good practice. But I don't see many people doing it, unfortunately. I wish, they, I wish it was picked up by more uh, to do it this way. I really do. But that's their problem, not mine. If they, if they crash their big project, then you know, you know, what am I supposed to do? OK, um, are there any more questions? All right. Okay, great. So we're going to resume with this. So you know, we're going to we're going to really cover ER diagram. Uh, we'll see later on that, that there's there's, there's um, a lot more to be said about design. This is this is really, but we've transitioned now into more the this kind of um, database design uh, part of the course. So that's where we're we're, we're headed, or we're, that's where we are. So, okay, great. Um, yeah. So Monday, by the way, is recitation, right? So that's uh, that's what we're going to do on Monday. And then we'll, we'll resume with this stuff uh, with ER on um, uh, next uh, Thursday. So. Okay, all right, see y'all later. I will stop recording now.